Brad here for NanoClean. NanoClean uses the power of copper and nano silver technology to cut through grease and kill the viruses. Buy your NanoClean today. Order now and I'll throw in a second bottle. Just give me more money. You're not really going to steal their ideas, are you? I'm not stealing them. They gave them to me. All right, welcome back. Hope you had a nice break. Okay, first a couple of house cleaning issues. Let's talk about attendance. I tried to do the word of the day. That seemed uh, not to work, to be a little too confusing. Just make sure you turn in an assignment every day for this class. So if you've noticed the video that you're watching right now is in an assignment section, just click turn it in every day. So I had you do peer review, click, turn it in. And every time you turn in the assignment, that will be the attendance. And so that should keep it simple. It's easy for me to keep track of, easy for you to do. Every day, you got to turn something in. Let's get going to the next thing. Okay, I'll post a article under the COVID-19 section, and it's talking about federalism with regards to the president. So the president while there was uh, an issue of personal protective equipment or ventilators, he said, that's the state's job. That's the governor's job to get all of that stuff. Now, when it comes to reopening the economy, he says, oh, no, that's not your power. That's my power. Now, if you don't like the president, you say he's being a hypocrite and he's switching uh, stances. If you do like the president, you're saying, well, he's adapting to the situation and different problems have different solutions. I'm not here to say president good, president bad. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm here to tell you about federalism. This is the system that we have set up. Remember the dance of the arrows, state versus national power? Right, you know, in real time, that's what you're seeing happening. You're seeing the president going, that's your job. That's not my job. And then he's switching going, that's my job. That's not your job. And the governors are doing the same thing. The governors are saying, hey, Washington, you should be doing this. And oh, wait a second. You can't do that. That's me. Okay. Overlapping concurrent powers at the executive level. The chief executive officer uh, is the president. The chief executive officer of the state is the governor, and their powers sometimes overlap. Does that make sense? So as you read that article or excerpt, I hope you find that interesting. All right, let's get into today's lecture. The West transformed. We are going to talk about mining, okay? There's that famous quote. I don't know what the question is, but the answer is money, money, mining. This will shape the West, okay? It's a boom and bust. When there's gold, everybody rushes in or silver. And when there's no gold or silver, everybody leaves and you get a ghost town. We will talk about the Transcontinental Railroad. Do you remember that? I hope you do. Uh, remember, where does the Transcontinental Railroad meet? All right, good job. Promontory Point, Promontory Point. Coming up soon, we'll talk about the railroad. Also, this will be tragically the, the end of the Native American lifestyle. Uh, as we think of Native Americans living in tribes and in teepees and hunting, obviously they still have reservations and they're still Native Americans and they're, and they're living their life, but it's not the same life as their ancestors. There's a, you know, a 15,000 year period of Native American life and then it's going to drastically come to an end or drastically change and that is with the transcontinental railroad okay so we'll talk about that okay what's the importance of mining it motivates people to head west you're in the east you're at your farm your lower class whatever you read about get rich quick scheme i'm going to california i'm finding the gold okay gold fever uh, what's the importance of the Transcontinental Railroad? It links the East and the West. If you remember from Utah studies, first people coming out of Utah, it's taking months, okay? It literally takes months to get here. 
months to get back. You got to wait for the weather to change. If you left from the east, it would be a minimum of a year before you would see that person go to Utah, come back and see that person. So when you're saying goodbye, you're saying goodbye for a really long time, maybe forever. Uh, with the railroad, it takes a couple of days to get here. Hey, I'm going to Utah. Okay, cool. I'll see you next week. Okay, big difference in the amount of time it takes to get to the west. Uh, why will their way of life come to the end? Talking about the Plains Indians, the buffalo. The buffalo, remember, it's not just their food. It's their shelter. It's their tools. The buffalo is their way of life. And when the buffalo are killed off, their way of life is also killed off. Let's talk about mining. Okay, we're talking about gold and silver, mostly in California, also in the Rocky Mountains. Okay. So you find the gold, people start putting up little cities, made, you know, little tents, it becomes sort of a city. Then you need hotels, you need stores, people flood into the West. Uh, remember, the merchants are making as much or more money than the people actually digging. Okay, the merchants selling the shovel, selling the whatever, and they're going to set up little stores and you get this little western town if you've seen a movie and then we have different immigrants the chinese on the west coast uh the irish on the east coast and here we go so we're talking about people and they're being dispersed and they're looking for gold okay you need to know the largest silver strike it's called the comstock load what's the largest silver strike in nevada called one two three comstock load okay good job Okay, Henry Comstock sold his claim for $11,000 and two mules. Was that a good deal? Deal or no deal? Deal Take it. or no deal? No deal! You're going home with $5. <laughs> that the sand stuck on the equipment was bummer to, it was you know getting in your way it turned out that that bluish tinted metal was silver and it was worth 300 million dollars oh anyhow nevada is now known as the silver state so no there's a giant silver strike okay comstock load boom we know that what does it do what is the impact look at the map real quick first off let me complain about this map because it's silver and gold is what color? The same color. Come on, dude. Put four colors on the map, please. But that's okay. It's it's the best map I could find. So you see the iron, you see the coal, you see silver and gold. And right there, you can see um, the silver at the edge of California, Nevada. But hold on. At this time, okay, this is what the map looked like. Utah Territory. It belonged to Utah, and Utah is going to get rich. Woo! Right? No, because what are they going to do next? Okay? Not saying that they took away Nevada from Utah because of this silver strike. Just saying, no, oh, that's probably what happened. Anyway, <laughs> there you go. They find silver in 1859. In 1861, Utah is dramatically shrunk. Okay? So, there you go. It's a coincidence, I'm sure. Do you know what a vigilante is? Okay, vigilante means you're going to take the law into your own hands. Batman is a vigilante. Batman is not an official deputy or deputized agent. He just goes out and goes after the criminals on his own. He is the vigilante, okay? Uh, this isn't in your book. This guy, I want you to know what the word vigilante means, okay? People... There's a lawlessness. There's a reason they call it the Wild West. You went out there to get your gold, and these towns blow up, and they get so big, but there's no bureaucracy. There's no one running the town. There's no sheriff, and if there is a sheriff, he can be bought off for cheap, and so there might not be any justice. And so this guy's name is X, and he's going to go into town, and he's going to take care of business. He gets his first fighting experience in Bleeding Kansas. Do you know what Bleeding Kansas is? Exactly. Good job. Remember Bleeding Kansas? Okay. Very good. When the there's a vote and the pro-slavery pro and the anti-slavery, they go into Kansas so that they can vote to 
what's that called when you get to decide whether slavery is good or bad based on a vote? Popular sovereignty. Remember that? And who's the guy that we learned about in Bleeding Kansas? John Brown, who's later important at which event? Harper's Ferry. Good job. Remember to see all how this plays together? Let's keep going here. Okay, Ghost Town. I assume you know what a ghost town is. Basically, once the ore is gone, there's no need for this town. Nobody lived there for any other reason than this extremely valuable metal was coming out of the ground. When the valuable metal is gone, the town is gone as well. So what I want you to understand, and we talked about this last year, okay, ghost town versus farming town, okay? What am I about to say? There we go. Hold on. Something strange in your neighborhood. Who you gonna call? Ghostbusters! All right. Back. Physical geography, human geography. Real quick, let's look at this wheel. It looks complicated. Uh, human geography, physical geography. You can see down here, this bottom green, geology, okay? The gold is affecting, let's say, the economics. And over here, you have the soils or the climate affecting economics. Well, if it's geology and the rocks run out, then the town goes away. But the soil or the climate, the farming town that was founded 150 years ago, it's still viable today because the soil and the climate hasn't really changed whereas the geology has changed. Does that make sense? Human geography, physical geography. Excellent. We're talking about the railroad. All right. The government is going to give you a subsidy. What is a subsidy? Push it to the limit. Okay, the government is going to pay you to do something, okay? They might subsidize roads they might subsidize health care here they're subsidizing the railroad okay they're going to give you money to make this railroad happen and here's a map of it remember this a little bit from last year okay where are they going to build this thing let's talk about it the blue one the blue one remember this from last year if you were here the blue one is called what you can't touch this The blue one is what? The red one is what? You got it. The blue one is the Central Pacific. And the red one is the Union Pacific. And what's my next question? What obstacle did you have to go through if you were in the Central Pacific? The Sierra Nevada Mountains. And if you're making the Union Pacific, what obstacle is in front of you? The Native Americans. Okay. Excellent. Good job for remembering that. Here's that slide again, in case you don't remember this. Okay, Central Pacific. It starts in Sacramento. It's heading east. Um, the other one is starting in Omaha, and it's heading west. Okay, you know about the obstacles. We just talked about it. You have Chinese immigrants. Uh, in addition to building the Transcontinental Railroad, what will the Chinese immigrants be doing on the West Coast? What's the other business? Okay, laundry. I don't care if you remember that, but for whatever reason, Chinese laundry, it's in every book. While the Union Pacific moved west again across the Great Plains, in California, the Central Pacific, after a fast start, had gotten stuck in the Sierra Nevadas. The mountains seemed impenetrable. And to make matters worse, Charles Crocker, whose job it was to break through them, could not seem to hold on to his workers. Three out of five stuck with him just long enough to get a free ride to the railhead, then set out on their own for the Nevada gold fields. His plans called for a workforce of 5,000. He had fewer than 600. Desperate, he suggested to his superintendent of construction, James Strobridge, that he try the Chinese, 
who were eking out a living working the gold and silver tailings abandoned by others. Strobridge was against it. He thought the Chinese were too small, too frail. They had no experience building railroads. Crocker told Strobridge to give the Chinese a chance. After all, he said, they had built the Great Wall of China. The first Chinese began turning up in early 1865, eager to work. They were already organized into work gangs, each with its own headman. Crocker expected that these fellows would come up there, you know, ones and twos like the other nationalities. And he found that the Chinese sort of marched up there as one group, and all he had to do was to deal with the, um, the foreman of that group. Of course, he would be the clan leader. Before long, 11,000 Chinese were at work on the Central Pacific. And Crocker was advertising for more in China. But hard work alone was no match for the Sierra Nevadas. Strobridge worried that his Central Pacific was falling even further behind in their race with the Union Pacific and soon armed the Chinese with black powder to blast their way through. It took 500 kegs of it a day, week after week, to carve cuts through the foothills. And then they came up against a face they called Cape Horn, solid rock nearly straight up and down, 2,000 feet above a raging river. There were no footholds, but the Chinese were told to make a ledge in the cliff, wide enough for a train. My grandfather was one of the people that they put in the baskets because he was small and light. And what they did was uh, that they would be lowered over cliffs and they would drill holes and then they'd set the dynamite in them and then they'd light the dynamite, and then they'd pull them up uh, uh, by, these, uh, by the baskets, and then they had to get out of there before the dynamite exploded. Huge masses of rock and debris were rent and heaved up in the commotion. Then came the thunders of the explosion like a lightning stroke reverberating along the hills and canyons as if the whole artillery of heaven was in play. Before the Central Pacific could get through the Sierras, the crews had to gouge out 15 tunnels. They worked in shifts around the clock, but averaged just eight inches a day. And they had to keep at it in every kind of weather. Snowstorms, 44 in number, varied in length from a short snow squall to a two-week gale. The heaviest storm of the winter began February 18th at 2 p.m. and snowed steadily until 10 p.m. of the 22nd, during which time six feet fell. John R. Gills, Charles Crocker had to punch the line through the Sierras that winter, the winter of 66. And the Chinese then had to build the railroad, lay the tracks. So they built these tunnels under the snow to keep advancing the line. And sometimes there would be snow slides. An entire cruise of Chinese would be trapped under tons of snow and their bodies would be left there and found the following spring. Sometimes the bodies were found with the picks and the shovels still in their hands. No one kept a precise count, 
but more than 1,200 Chinese died digging and blasting for Charles Crocker and the Central Pacific. When somebody died, you, you just didn't dig a grave for him, put him down in the grave. You, you went to a lot of trouble to get his uh, remains back to the village that he came from. Because a Chinese doesn't want to be buried anywhere. He wants to be buried where his ancestors were buried because he wants to stick together. Finally, in 1868, after three long years of backbreaking, dangerous labor, the Central Pacific crews did what few had believed anyone could do. They broke out of the High Sierras. Right. What are the dates of the Civil War? Do you remember? Inconceivable! You don't remember? We just learned that. Oh, you do remember. Oh, okay, good job. Okay, 1861, 1865, okay? And so this is right during that time. Are we going to have a northern route or a southern route, do you think? Exactly. It ain't going to be southern. It'll be the most southern northern route. It'll be in the middle of the country, okay? Does that make sense? Okay, why they're not going to build this thing in the south? You have all the, indus the, all the industry and all the money in the north. They're not going to be like, yeah, let's build it down in the south. Even though... Uh, from a weather perspective, that might have been the easiest route. They're going to kind of build it right through the middle, and that's why it's going to meet here in Utah. Excellent. Okay, you're paid by the mile. You're going to race to lay the track. Uh, remember the Chinese laborers? This is my favorite story. They put the guy in the basket. They put the nitroglycerin or the dynamite in there, and they lower him over the, you know, and I tell you this. Is, so imagine you show up to work. Uh, okay, your job is to get in this basket and we're going to lower you over the cliff. And you're like, oh, wait, I don't think that sounds very safe. Oh, hold on just a second. We got to put the dynamite in the basket too. Like that's your job, like to get lowered over the cliff with the dynamite and then you're going to blow up stuff. I don't, someone's got to pull you back up real quick. I don't know. Uh, to me, that's crazy. Uh, probably not OSHA approved. Anyhow, 2,000 dead or hurt, avalanches, the disease, the cold, lack of food. You're on a mountain that's difficult enough, but you're also trying to blow holes uh, into this granite mountain. Um, one of the primary sources, they're not even that far away. And the guy says, man, we're going to get through this in two weeks. And two months later, he's like, oh, we're almost done. We'll be there and definitely get through soon. And six months later, he's like, I can't believe we're not through the mountain. You know, it just takes a long time to blast a hole through this mountain. All right. They strike to get more money. They don't get the money. Um, Chinese laundry's on there. Cool. Okay. Know where the railroad meets. You're in Utah. It meets in Utah. What are the two sides that meet? Right. The Central Pacific and the Union Pacific. Very good. Okay. Excellent. Uh, make sure you can draw it on a map. Awesome. Okay, so how does the railroad impact the West? It does in a variety of ways. Uh, it's easier to get to the West. More people are going to go to the West. You can start to vacation and come out here. Once you get more people, enough people, you can have states. Now we're going to look at this. If you remember this from last year, check that out. Remember what's happening here. Take a second to look at it while I um, see here. Okay, so you see even the horses look starving. The people, you can see their bones, especially on the spine of this one guy over here. And what are they doing? They're destroying the railroad, okay? They know that the railroad is, is going to be further encroachment onto their land. They're burning up the wood, and they're going to take away the tracks, and they're trying to fight against the railroad, okay? And you can see... These people are struggling, and, and, and a picture's worth a thousand words, so there we go. Okay, this is a good quote. Their struggle serves as a poignant example of how the Transcontinental Railroad could simultaneously destroy one way of life as it ushered in another. Okay, Utah Historical Society. Here's another picture. Okay, remember this one? What's happening there? What are they doing on that train? 
They're sightseeing. They're shooting the buffalo from the train, okay? Uh, fast forward if you don't want to see this. It's just a picture. It's just what happened, okay? Those are all the buffalo skulls. You could go out there and you could shoot a buffalo, and that's another get-rich-quick uh, scheme. However, once you've shot all the buffalo, they're not going to come back, okay? So the Plains Indians in 1865... There's 360,000 of them. They're hunting. They're gathering. They're living their, their way of life. Okay? You can imagine what that is. Something else about this is a buffalo. Okay. This is a buffalo. There you go. There you go. Yes. Yeah. There's a buffalo. It's your food. It's your food. It's your warm. It's everything. Okay? Uh, that's how you make your house. The buffalo is your way of life. It's Buffalo Mart. Okay? That's your one-stop shop. Okay, we can stop there for today. Make sure you check back for tomorrow's assignment. Have a wonderful day.